So thank you for inviting me here to this conference. And uh, since I come from Germany, you might expect a German perspective on this European crisis. And if you expect that, I have to disappoint you. Because uh, I tend to have uh, strong reservations as far as the general approach from Germany and also, I must say, as a commission uh, approach uh, to, this, uh, oh, to this crisis has been done. Sorry, I have some difficulties here. Work. So, as far as we heard the official commission positions to this crisis and the approach how to get over it, uh, I think, thank you very much, uh, I think we should have a look on the figures and let the figures speak. And. Uh, Sorry for apologies, these slides are in German, but I got the most recent version just this morning. If we see on the figures, we see very gloomy figures, I must say. If we see the GDP change we have seen in some countries between 2009 and 2012, those countries which had this excessive debt burdens, private as well as uh, public debt, we see that with the exception of Ireland, all the other countries were shrinking over a period of three years. This is a very exceptionally situation. This is not a short dip in the statistic, a short recession, a short uh, slowing down of economic activity. This is a severe crisis we have seen here. And uh, this crisis certainly, Karl Pichelmann has always shown it, in an increase of unemployment rates, uh, which is very severe in some countries, as in, as in Spain especially and in Greece. And I think behind these figures lies a lot of misery there's a lot of needs of people not ha knowing how to cope with daily life, we must say. This is a very serious finding we have, it's very serious figures we have, and we all see the political turbulences involved with all these kind of measures. But we have also some success stories within the official programs. And uh, the big success story of the present approach is OMT. I fully agree with Karl Pichelmann on that issue. The only remark I have to do that, that is we should have done it earlier. We should have done it right at the beginning. Then we wouldn't have talked so much about this crisis. We wouldn't sit here today and still discuss some very severe problems. And this is a kind of fever curve of the monetary crisis we, have, we see, that's the yield spreads. And what we see here, especially if you take the case of Greece, which at the top had a yield of 40% on public yields. This means uh, this was not sustainable even in the short run. And uh, we also see, this, we saw that at the end of, at the beginning of last year when the haircut became effective, it, they raised again. And only after summer now, since we have the announcement of the ECB, they calmed down. And they calmed down not just in Greece, they calmed down in Portugal, they calmed down in Spain, and Italy, and these countries are already much more able to raise money on the private capital market than they have been before. And this indeed is a very good sign, and this indeed is certainly a kind of basic guarantee that the euro area will stay together in its present form for the time being. So this is certainly something very fundamental we have achieved by that. But this is certainly a necessary condition that the euro area will recover, but definitely not, not a sufficient condition. And the sufficient condition refers to other things. What we see here is a change of unit labor cost in the crisis countries. We see that they can, unit labor costs can change by two impacts. They can decrease by rising productivity or by decreasing wages. And what we see here is that in the case of Ireland, we have a sort of uh, good example in a, in a way, good example, because mainly it was a rise in productivity, which is the red one, red part of it, and to some extent also a decline in wages. So they can, could improve their competitive very significantly. In Spain, it was basically also, uh, in a way, a good way, it's mainly the rise in productivity, because uh, wage, wages rose to a slightly extent in, in, in Spain still. But in Greece, we had certainly a very adverse case. 
uh, we had mainly a very significant decline in wages, but also a decline in productivity. That's not what you want to see. That's simply not what you want to see. And uh, in, the, in, the, in Portugal, it's also more rising productivity. So the, the programs we have here to increase competitiveness of these countries, which is necessary, have certainly had a very severe burden on the wage process in these countries, very severe burden. Some, to some extent accompanied, which is beneficiary, by increases in productivity, that helps a lot. But especially in the case of Greece, it certainly the process is totally perverse. And how does that translate into prices? I mean, that's the final and ultimate question, that because you want to increase competitiveness. Wages is a very important part of that story, but it's not the only part. And when we see to the prices, it's very difficult to measure it properly. We, uh, we took the GDP deflator without tax changes, because it's heavily influenced by tax changes, especially if you think that VAT increases in these countries. We have counted that out. And there you see that uh, uh, the GDP deflator in, in, in these countries, especially in the crisis countries like Spain, Portugal, and Greece, is flat, simply flat. But this is not the depreciation you want to see. Where you see a depreciation is Germany. There you didn't want to see it. So what we have seen here on the price level area is that we don't have the dip, real depreciation in the crisis country, which they desperately need to improve their competitiveness. So the whole story the EU Commission is now doing of inciting a real depreciation by slashing on wages doesn't simply work presently as far as prices are concerned. And this is a very bad story. Sorry. The debt ratio we've seen, uh, have seen by Carl Fischelmann, is not decreasing. You do not expect that in the short run if you have such a kind of policy because the economy is slashed down very severely, revenues shrink. We will see that later a bit. How are deficits have been reduced? How did they have been reduced? If we distinguish between primary balance and structural balance and the, and the headline balance, we see that Ireland has uh, reduced uh, both the structural deficit to some extent and uh, especially also the primary balance to, to some uh, to, to very uh, 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 prominent uh, extent. Primary balance means this is, ex this is def the deficit without paying the inter interest payments. So they have done, they have reduced the interest payments uh, to a large extent. In Greece, the structural deficit has been decreased very significantly, minus 12 uh, percentage point of GDP since two, from 2009 to 2012. This is unprecedented, I must say, unprecedented. So they have done a lot, if you see at the structural deficit, and they have also reduced the primary deficit to a very, very large extent. We have not seen that in any other country. So the imposition of fiscal consolidation measures in Greece was very strict, very severe, and has been, very, has been done very, very much. The actual deficit has reduced less than these, and this is certainly the high interest payments and the decline of the economy, which has prevented that these slashes on public expenditure transfer appropriately back to the headline deficit. And if we look at the time 2010 to 2012, we see that Ireland has made the most progress, not Greece, because most in the Greece case happened in 2009. How did they do that? Did they slash revenue or did they increase spending? A very, a very, important, a very important distinction, because we know that the multipliers are different depending on all right, whether you slash spending or increase taxes. Almost all research says that the multipliers of increased spending, of decreased spending, are higher than the multipliers of increased taxes. So the austerity effect of higher taxes is lesser than the austerity effect of reduced spendings. So uh, a good strategy would be to focus on higher taxes to overcome the deficit situation. 
And uh, what you see here is that uh, Ireland has uh, slashed spending and uh, revenues were slightly lower. So Ireland had, had more of a spending approach. Greece definitely too. Revenues also shrunk due to the bad situation of the economy. Spain did the other way. They also slashed spending, but to a much lesser extent, and they increased taxes to much tax revenues to a much stronger extent. The same applies to Portugal. So we should so the, the fiscal stance in Spain and Portugal was in the effect much lesser than in Greece, which focused almost on spending cuts. And let me compare now a very severe comparison between Germany during the Great Depression and at the end of the 20s and Greece, because uh, a lot of that what happened in Greece now reminds us in Germany of a situation we have seen at the end of the 20s of the last century. And if you see here, have a here look in the economic performance, which is the GDP development, and we put in 2008, 200 in Greece, and 1929, 200 in Germany. And what you see here is an astonishing and certainly shocking parallel development of GDP development here uh, between those countries. So Greece is facing the very same hardship now, as far as GDP is concerned, as Germany faced at the end of the 20s. And certainly that makes clear how severe the situation is there. And before this crisis, I think nobody would have recommended such a kind of course in times of a crisis, knowing that this could happen in a country because the political implications are, are way too severe in such a situation. And we see also that the spending cuts in, 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 in Germany at that time were parallel during the first years, but then even stronger than in, 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 the, last, in, the, in the last years. But the effect was the very same uh, on GDP. And uh, I, before I started my presentation, I said there, there may be some overlapping slides between Carl Fischelsmann's representation and mine, except my last but one. And this is this one. This is GDP forecast errors by the EU Commission. And what you see here is we draw all the forecasts of the GDP Commission, which makes them twice a year in spring and fall, starting in 2008 when the crisis was not there. The gross rates in, in Greece were start at the starting point of the forecast 4%, and the EU Commission, as many others, forecasted a slight slowing down, down to 2 point something percent. Then the crisis started, and it was clear that the fiscal austerity program would start. And the EU Commission, in their first crisis forecast, said, OK, there will be a slight dip in the, in the GDP in 2009, but in 2010, we will have growth again. And in the continuing periods, this forecast had to be revised downwards each time. But always, the Commission said, and then it will go up next year. Then growth was delayed until 2011, 2012, 2013. The last forecast in fall 2012 says, OK, no, no chance of growth. We will have a lesser shrinking now. But you still have this kind of perspective. Things will improve. Well, we all human and commit errors. And I also commit errors. But I try to commit unsystematic errors. So if I've committed one error, I try to commit another one next time. The EU Commission seems to prefer to commit the same error all the time. This is a systematic error of the effect of its policy, a systematic error. And that's behind the debate about the size of the multipliers. The IMF chief economist Oliver Blanchard has, in a very broad paper published at the beginning of this year, proven that the multipliers were heavily underestimated by the EU Commission and the IMF as well, so it's a criticism of its own uh, house as well. <coughs> what can we learn from this? We learn that this kind of approach of a synchronized public and private deleveraging increases multipliers to a very severe extent. And it increases these multipliers to values which are well above the critical values 
which have been computed by the OECD, where you can be successful. That means at a critical values, a uh, consolidation policy will lead, until up to the critical value, a consolidation policy will lead to a lower debt burden in, in the country, in an economy. If it's above that, an austerity course will lead to a higher debt burden because the economy is so much harmed that revenues will shrink so much that you will not end up with the target you have, a lower debt burden. And we are well, according to these calculations, we are well above this critical level. So if we have the same goal to achieve, to relieve these countries of their debt burden, this approach is not successful and cannot be successful given all the computations we have. So we must have a change, and this is certainly the conclusions I have. The euro is in a recession and will stay there. I do not believe the forecast of the EU Commission that we will get out of it at sight, as long as this approach is continued. If it changes, I change my forecast. The ECB intervention was helpful to restore trust, and certainly a sufficient condition for recovery has been fulfilled to that. Fiscal austerity is in a mess. It is simply not successful. And we are also to, to see that wage reductions are <coughs> not matched by price reductions by far. We have a change in the distribution there, which is very severe, and in that sense, Carl Bichmann is absolutely right, structural reforms have to apply to the goods sectors to much more extent than we have seen up to now. That should be put in the front of structural reforms, not labor market reforms. There we have seen significant reductions. And what we need is certainly a change of fiscal policy, not stop consolidation, but definitely stretch it in a way that the economy is not so much out, because if you don't do that, you will not be successful. Thank you very much. <laughs>